Hey, I'm Logan Radio Rocks, better known as Logan Summit. And guess what? I've got Kevin from Lit. He actually is here. Kevin, how are you? That's a glorious mustache you've got there, sir. The nose neighbor is strong. It's brought to you by Magnum PI. And it's been <laughs> it's been about 13 or 14 years since we've seen each other. I don't expect you to remember. I'll just tell you this. It ended with us in the middle of a dance club, back to back air guitar, singing your freaking songs to a cover band playing your song on, uh, on the stage. It was very meta, as the kids might say these days. What was that like when you first got on tour? Was it like 98, 99, somewhere in there, the early 2000s? Our first, our first tour was 97, and we were touring for uh, Trip and Life Fantastic. And, and we did some out-of-state stuff when we were younger uh, with, the, with, the, with the band name Razzle. Um, we went That's to Phoenix. Uh, yeah, but dude, going to Phoenix, those were great times. Th- that was our first time putting the toe in the water and going out into uncharted territory, you know? All right, so here's the deal. You're playing club gigs, and what's the vehicle you're traveling in? Yo, talk about the first vehicle. No one ever talks about that. First dude, tour vehicle. A, yeah, it was just a 12-passenger van. Um, that was just going to, to Phoenix. But when we did our first tour in 99, or 97, excuse me, uh, we were in a Winnebago. We, uh, yeah. we had just a little RV and we had two crew, uh, a guy named Tony that actually lives right next door to me. He's one of my best friends. He was my best man at my wedding. He's actually the guy that introduced me to uh, Adrian and Jeremy. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, he drove, you know, the, the, the RV. And then we had a guy named Rob Castaneda that came out and did merch of all things. But I think he helped load in. I mean, dude, it was a bare bones well, yeah, tour. Everybody and- did everything. You were carrying your yeah. own stuff. Now, look, there's yeah. there's no rock star. Uh, no. You, you know what I've always said? If it wasn't for local music, there would be no music. Everyone starts from somewhere, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true, man. And we did. We, we did a whole U.S. tour in front of in- nobody. There was nobody at the shows, literally. Uh, and by nobody, I mean, dude, there was 15, 20, yeah. at most, maybe 40. And we were out with a band called Lifter that had some MTV play. Um, they were a very, very shoegazer um, alternative rock band. And then we were um, also out with a band called Radish, which was fronted by Ben Queller. All right, so I know who Ben Queller is, but I have yeah. not heard of either of those bands. And remember, I was on the radio for over a decade. Never heard of those two acts. Yeah, dude, uh, Radish. Um, well, Ben Queller, yeah. has, he's on tour right now. He's he's yeah. pretty big in his own right. Yeah, so. he's doing his own thing. Yeah, so we know Ben really well. And um, I wish we were still in touch with the Lifter guys, but Lifter um, kind of broke up. And uh, But, dude, that was a very, very special time. That was us. And it didn't even matter. The fact that there'd be even 10 people there was a big deal. And what was really cool about that tour is the opening bands and whatever crew we might have was supporting the other bands. Yeah. Um, so you would stay all night long. You'd be there because we were one giant happy family moving our way across the U.S. playing in front of literally nobody. But the funny thing is we played in Madison, the Madison Theater. I forget where it was. When we went back in 99 and we headlined this theater, the first time we played there was literally not really anybody there. When we went back in 99 after our um, A Place in the Sun album came out and Mine Worst Enemy was on the radio, there was a guy in the front row wearing the what we call the flame dice shirt which was from that tour and he was in the front row and we asked him dude were you at that show and he was and uh so i think we ended up hanging out with him afterwards it was you know stuff like that's special dude it is it's it's so special look i had a wall nation play in front of 14 people and then the, the, and then one year after that uh i'm sit, sitting there talking to him at a sold out show at the same place that you guys played the train station with imagine dragons sold no out way. sold out yeah uh, it was right after imagine dragons played mtv he literally he walked out on on off the stage and onto people's hands. They were supporting his full weight. He was standing. He walked 10 feet into the crowd. I was doing stage managing. I looked at my buddy. I go, if he whips it out and pisses on him, they are going to literally open up their mouths and say, ah, it's going to be a poison (laughs) album all over again right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, I saw, uh, uh, what's the guy from... 
Cage the Elephant. Uh, oh yeah, it's the singer. The singer. I saw the singer walk on hands before. That was pretty neat. Dude, it's like it's like really. Are they doing that? Hey, are, yeah. Now you mentioned MTV, and you were like, "Yo, this band Lifter had some had some stuff on MTV." Let's talk about MTV for a second, because I will tell. Back in the day when MTV was a thing, yeah, it was it, it was like the internet for us. Okay, we had Victoria's Secret magazines and we had videos. Okay, yeah. and let me tell you something about a lit video dude pamela anderson lee and you're walking on her body how does that happen how do you, dude were you in a room and a bunch of people were like pitch me your craziest idea and you guys huddled up and went pamela anderson lee there is a story behind that video uh miserable wasn't even uh on the hype sticker on the album it was never going to be a single until we actually went out on the road and people were just singing that song on their own. So people that had the album were liking the song and singing it back to us. So we went to the the label RCA and we said, dude, there's a song miserable and people are loving it. We really think that should be the next single. So after some time, they agreed with us. And uh, <laughs> so then they start pitching us video ideas uh, of a 50 foot woman eating us like us and it sounded really lame. You know, we already did um, My Worst Enemy was a good video. Uh, Ziploc was a really good video. Yeah. And this was going to be our third video from the album. And uh, then, long story short, we got called in by Pamela Anderson's people to, uh, they were going to use one of our songs on one of their shows. And we said, of course, that's cool. We like that. And then they said, hey, do you guys want to do a walk on? Meaning you'll just, you'll yeah. make an appearance in the, in the TV show VIP. I remember and that we, show. Yeah. And then we were going to make an appearance. And then they came back to us again and said, listen, we want to write a whole episode around you guys, how Pam and her posse saved you guys. And we said, Dude, that's insane. All right, let's do it. So while we were filming that for a whole week in LA, we were filming this TV episode called Hard Val's Night. Her name is Val, Valerie Irons in the episode. And um, our people came to her and said, hey, um, we're gonna do this video with a 50 foot woman. We want Pam to be the woman. She agreed to do it. She said, hey, when you guys release the video, why don't you release it on my TV show? It'll be worldwide. So I've met kids from Greece that never even heard of us, but they watched VIP and yeah. when they saw our video on VIP so it was a really good way to connect us with um well they with watch. a wide, yeah. bigger yeah with bigger audience you right. know Baywatch really cool. was the biggest show in the world at a I certain know, point we fail to recognize that like cuz we think <laughs> we think so so uh, so US right yeah. everything in yeah. the US is the biggest well there's a whole wide world out there dude I played a show with uh, Sugar Cold I filled in uh, in Kalamazoo Michigan in 08 or 09 I think it was what a great just band. My, my little site y'all they're fucking fantastic we actually just had uh, Marco come out and do uh, really bouncing off the walls yeah that's awesome uh, no but two years ago yo that's so funny when I was on the radio uh, you know this guy named Bildo wanted to try to you know get, give him a zinger a zinger question he's like yes so he looks at Tim and he goes so uh, bouncing off the walls what's that you, you, it's uh, that hook in there uh, another song for the radio station so are you just writing a song to get on the radio he goes no it's about crystal meth and the, <laughs> and the room went quiet and everybody was just like okay and he's like yeah it's like that. And you know what? All I could think of was, all right, you know, a lot more songs than you would think are actually about Crystal Beth these days. Uh, sure. I mean, come on, man. All right, so let's get back to the important stuff. What is the singular greatest rock and roll moment? Look, I have my rock and roll moment. Uh, when I was sitting on the side of the stage with D. Snyder after we put Blink-182 on stage, and he looks at me and he goes, hey, man, uh, except for that drummer, they're not much for musicians, but they are great with their stage presence and I go you once filed your teeth to be a better stage sing like presence yeah. that's a big statement coming from you and he just started yeah. laughing what's your biggest rock and roll moment that moment when you went holy I am here now dude there's a lot of them but something that kind of jumps out at me is we played uh, Anaheim Stadium which is a stadium right down the street from my house I yeah. grew up in this area I've been to a million motocrosses. I've been there with my dad to see baseball games, um, the monster truck jams and all that kind of stuff. We opened for the original Black Sabbath at that Ooh, stadium. Oh, yo, how'd you get that gig? I mean, you gave out a hand job to somebody at that. Well, yeah, of course, naturally. <laughs> naturally. Uh, it, was, it was a K-Rock Weenie Rose yes. show. It was, it was the only one they ever did at Anaheim Stadium. 
and um so we were honored to be on the bill uh and it was yeah. a big deal and and it was it was scheduled as ozzy osbourne he was to be the headliner Ooh. and it wasn't ozzy it was black sabbath and it was all original members and it doesn't get any bigger or better than that i'll tell you this yeah. one of my prized possessions that i gave to tony as a present and he still hasn't worn it in a video yet and i think that's because it's purple and he it's yeah. it, because it's purple he hasn't worn it but i got him a crew shirt from iron maiden bro Wow. Yeah, dude. And I'm That's like, you got to wear it in a video. And he's like, it's, it's purple. And I'm it's like, it's, it's a nice purple. Yeah. yeah. You know, just a lot of black in videos and whatnot. Let's let's step back and take a deep breath. Because I got to tell you, I don't know if you know this or not, but all the bands that I know, apparently Lit, and specifically you, you guys are one of the most liked bands. Did you know that? Like, you, no I one speaks badly of you. I'm sure there's people that speak badly of us. I'm certain of it. But uh, okay, that's nice. I will. I want to know what of those people what you did to them right now, <laughs> dude. It's uh, I I don't know, but uh, yeah, I'm just joking. I appreciate hearing that. And you know, we try to be nice to everybody. We we always try to hang out after shows. We um, we're fans of other artists, so we know um, you know what it what it what it means to hang out and meet people. Like you said earlier, you know, get a handshake. Uh, photo if they want you know just and sometimes just hearing stories of people's personal stories and the connection to the band is is honestly it's it, it means a lot to us um, well, it's got to be why you got into it i mean you get into it to write the songs and to, and to get on your teen yanks and, and at, at a certain point it's about a, a business side of, of some things for a little while so it's got to be great to actually come back to the place where you started which is about the feelings right i mean you wrote music because of the feelings that you had yeah, and you need yeah, to get it I mean, out my main objective when I was younger was just to, not to make money, not to sign autographs, nothing like that. I just wanted to be on stage. What is it like to step up the steps and walk on stage? Because I'd watch a lot of, you know, heavy metal videos on MTV back when I was really young. Van Halen, more, most specifically, you had to watch the Unchained video. And I wanted to be that on stage. Um, and so there's a piece of me every time we walk on stage that unchained video is playing in my yeah. head like man I, I just want to be on stage i want to be that tonight you know I want that's dude that that is super cool uh that just to walk out on stage right and to see everybody just to get that feeling i doing stage announcements on the radio was always huge and i remember i, I was on tour with tony and goldfinger and stuff for a little while and i was like hey can i stage dive He's like, these people don't know you. We're not in Hartford anymore. They will drop your ass. And I'm like, please, can I stage dive? And he's like, all right, I got to say something first. He's like, don't drop him. We like him. Yeah. I barely cleared the barriers. Um, you know, before we talk about what you, you're up to now, I, I, there is there is a moment in time that I do want to I do want to talk about because you and I are older now. And, and I think this is a poignant uh, moment in, in time. And I want you to think about it. Um, I was on the radio. I woke up on September 11th and I went into work because we shut off all the music and we sat there and we talked to people and we and we talked to what they were what they were feeling and 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 we turned the music off. And no one talks about September 11th and the effect that it had on music and the music industry because that was such a such a small thing in comparison to everything else that affected but most metallica's catalog was pulled from the radio sugar colt's first single was pulled from the radio yeah and you went on tour that day what yeah we were we like? were in we were supposed to play um birch hill in new jersey that night the night of that uh then so september 10th we were party in, in New York City for Jeremy's birthday. Jeremy's birthday is September 11th. Oh, wow. And so we were we couldn't party on the 11th because we had a show at Birch Hill. So we were partying on September 10th. So I was the first one awake in our hotel and I was sharing a room with Alan, our, our then drummer. And uh, he woke up, he goes, dude, watch TV if you want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still sleep. And I said, all right. So I turned on the TV and, and it, it appeared that a small plane hit a, hit a building and I kind of laughed. I go, dude, somebody ran a plane into yeah. a building. But but I thought it was an accident. Yeah. Like, and so my first instinct was like, how 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 silly of this person that they they couldn't fly a plane good enough to steer away from the building. I know. That was that was my honest thoughts. And that I said, was my oh. thought too when I first saw, saw the first one. But then it's live and then yeah. 
Then the second yeah, one Yeah, then happens. shit got real. And then um, I quickly called Jeremy's room. And, and one thing you don't do is call Jeremy and wake him up. He's like a grizzly bear. So I called him, woke him up. And I said, dude, turn on the TV. Something's going down. Yeah. And so he turned it on. And then we all started meeting up. And it was scary, man. It was real scary. And then outside our windows, we were only, I don't know, 10 miles away from the actual place. So if you looked hard enough, you could see the plume of smoke. And you could see the buildings you could see the plume of smoke get bigger as the buildings would fall so we were watching it live on tv and then there was you know there was a delay from the real time to the tv was a delay and i yeah. remember watching the second one fall both live and on tv and just watching it and just you didn't know what was happening next i mean it was buildings falling down pentagons airplanes and fields it was like what's going to happen next are bombs going to really start being shot and we're you know kind of near ground zero i mean yeah you were new york, new york city is is a target just like la would be a, a, a target um so it was scary being that far away from home and and um you know going through that but you know and yes it did it did slow things down because yeah. what happened you know our our record company our caa um they told us that all radio stations are only going to comfort music meaning yeah anything that was a hit they are not trying to break any new songs right now and we had lipstick and bruises from uh from atomic hitting the airwaves at that particular time so they kind of pulled it well now here's the thing though lit you as a band at well especially you has been up and down emotionally uh i and I, we don't i don't don't we're not gonna we're not gonna get into all that but but you you especially because you've been there from the very start you've been up and down uh a lot of tragedy a lot of great times a lot of bad times but you're still here and 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 that that speaks volumes uh, about mm. about music and and the fact that that lit has remained through all of this no matter no matter if it's if it's tragedy in your personal lives in your band lives or in in reality based everybody's lives um yeah. you've been able to persevere and go on do you always come back to the music no matter what it does the music save you yeah i mean it's all it's kind of all we know to be honest with you i've been uh, i've known aj and jeremy since we were fresh teenagers you know um i i hate to almost say this but uh, but it's the fucking reality i've been playing on stage with aj and and give or take about two years but uh, with jeremy and, and al uh, but uh i've been playing on stage with aj for 35 years Ooh, wow 35 <laughs> years we started when we were little kids so i mean yeah. when i say it's all we really know it really is kind of all we really know i mean i'm a photographer as well so over the years we've picked up other other things and have done other things um jeremy owned a bar a restaurant aj at one point owned a salon and um could he I, cut I hair it, it, can he do that yeah, yeah 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 he owned a bar like a really cool barber shop in orange county and and he, yeah he cut hair um art from everclear used to drive all the way down to have aj cut his hair <laughs> that's great <laughs> yeah um, it's, that's a rock and roll moment kids right there yeah. and he's probably still using got to be uh yo remember that shit everybody was using that back in the 2000s every every radio personality every rock star it was got to be they should have sponsored the shit on a warp tour man yeah <laughs> all right so here's the deal you're still in it you've released new music i mean uh you, your release tastes like gold and in, uh, in 2022 so yeah here's we're gonna talk about that but before we get there i asked tony this too yo man as best you can what the f is the difference between the music industry when you first got into it and how you're making a record now i know it's a big question streamline that because because it's now up to you right yeah dude i do so many more things now um but you know let me start by saying we have been so fortunate to be part of an era where RCA used to fly us to New York just to go to parties and meet people. Oh, wow. Yeah, dude. I mean, and they would put us up in the W on 49th and Lexington. Ooh. Yeah, oh, that's good stuff right there. Yeah, man. dude, I, I, I can't complain. We've done some really cool things. We've been a part and associated with some really cool big things. And it's been a lot of fun. And dude, every, like I said before, I did not get into this for the money. I'm not rich by any means. Um, I got into it to entertain and, and be a part of the music, write the music. And yeah. you know, more, more things get added to that as you, as you continue through the years and you're just like, wow. Then all of a sudden, you, you know, 
all right, how about this year we try and play with that band or tour with that band or, you know, do some cool stuff like that. But um, I'm really proud of us hanging in there and not giving up. And, and we just kind of keep going and keep going and things are building and um, being rebuilt and restructured. So uh, speaking of Taste Like Gold, our latest album, I, I would put that album up against A Place in the Sun. It's a great album. I love it. What's your favorite song yeah. off of it? Taste Like Gold, the title track. And we've only had two albums with title tracks. And A Place in the Sun right. has A Place in the Sun on it. And Taste Like Gold has a song called Taste Like Gold. Now, I'm really um, interested. During the pandemic, a lot of musicians, not to cut you off, but I did. <laughs> a lot of musicians re-released because they own it and could do it live music. And and you were able to release Woodstock, baby. I mean, how, how dope was that? To be able to go back cool. and remaster that and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, and... Uh, it, that was a special show, as, a, as you know, and yeah. we weren't really a part of the shenanigans that went down. <laughs> um, we were there. We played the first day, which everything was fine the first day. It was, it was the second and third day when shit really hit the fan. But um, uh, we are hopefully going to release some more live music, um, some different stuff. I think we're kind of a different band now. We have yeah. a different drummer. Um, we have a bunch of different kind of music. So I really, I think that's a good snapshot of, of lit when things were taking off on the radio and all that stuff. But uh, um, it is I a snapshot that, in time of, of your, of, of really your, your moment in the sun. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, that was when you were getting amped up at, at no bigger show than you could. I mean, shit, yeah. man, unless you're playing Wembley, I don't know if it got any bigger than that. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just a, what a great moment. And day one was a great day. Uh, there was a lot of great stuff going on there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the music has changed, but you've changed. You're older now. You've got a wife. You've got a kid. It, obviously, the music's going to change. Like you, I listen to Eminem, and he's talking about Moby is too old. Let go. And it's it, nobody listens to techno. But guess what, Eminem? <laughs> no one listens to you anymore either. How do you stay relevant? I believe. I believe your answer has to be just keep it from the heart, right? Or, yeah, and and I don't, dude. I don't know where we stand and not everything, I and mean, we're not headlining arenas right now. Um, but we still go out and we play and people show up and and um, it, it feels good. We're honored that people would one spend money and come out on a even a Wednesday night. We just played a Wednesday night up in uh, Northern California and it was a great crowd. And I was just like, holy crap! Like we're still doing this. It's still going. It's still happening. So we feel very very honored to be able to do that. And we're very appreciative of it all. When you go out there and 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 you're done with your show and you're talking to the people. Um, what are the things that you hear the most from everybody these days? What, what's the one thing that people want to relate to Kevin from Lit with? I, I, I'm sure you hear probably the same questions and stuff. Well, it feels good that we, you know, we get off stage and people are, typically are like, man, great show, great energy. And I like that, man. I mean, we're not so old yet that we have to slow it down. You know, I'm, I, I literally am putting on the same show. Uh, if I would. I would even say I'm putting on a better show than I did when I was younger, even on off a place in the sun. I just, I'm more comfortable with the stage now and stuff. And, um, we're better at our instruments. Everything's a little bit more fluid, if that makes any sense. Yes, so, uh, we're just more mature about the whole thing. Um, I just hope people are entertained and enjoy the music. And I, I don't really care to have much more, you know, that's awesome. I, yeah. I'm, I'm able to support a family and, and we have a home and, and, uh, life is good and I, I it feels good that i was able to do that and stick to my guns um dude i mean we started in 88 and then uh 98 we signed with rca so for 10 years we were we were going at it for 10 years we didn't know if it was going to happen you know yeah right and, uh, and finally finally it felt like all right i think we got this and then once they took the match and threw it out in the, in the dry brush, man, it took fast. It was crazy. The phone wouldn't stop ringing. We were getting offers to do all kinds of crazy things. We were tossed into the machine and it felt cool, but it was also kind of scary. I mean, getting the offer is one thing, but actually showing up uh, at, at Conan O'Brien and setting your gear up to play live on TV is a little <laughs> nerve wracking. So. I would think so. I would absolutely think so. And, and you know what? Uh, you, you got to the other side. Uh, yeah. So congratulations. Now, Thanks, man. last thing, last thing. Yeah. Look, about 10 years ago, 
when Place in the Sun, not about, by the way, it was 10 years ago. Place in the Sun was 15 years old. So yeah. guess what? It's yeah, 25 years old. And you know what? I have not seen yet, and I would love to come out and put you on stage for it. I'll come out to Anaheim. We'll do it. I mean, you do it again at the House of Blues. But I think you need to go front to back for the 25-year anniversary uh, of the uh, of that album. I mean, I, th- I want to hear it. I know a lot of other people want to hear it. The question is, do you want to do it? Dude, we've actually talked about it, but we haven't made any big moves yet. Uh, we Next February will be the 25th anniversary. So obviously next year we'll mark the right. 25th anniversary. And we've we've talked about doing it. We did some stuff for the 15th anniversary, but we didn't go we didn't go huge. We did some dates over in the UK and then we did um, our, our hometown for the 15th anniversary. Maybe we do something a little bigger next year um, and do the 25th anniversary show. And yeah, it, it, it's pretty awesome playing the album front to back. It's pretty it's, rad. It's a pretty rad album. And you know what? Thanks, that that um, was at a point. That was at a point where you where you curated an album and and you figured out where the songs laid into the whole uh, the whole magic of the whole album. Look, the, the, they sat there in a room and literally were like, "All right, first second third i mean you cared about every single thing because you couldn't just download it yeah right i mean yeah maybe it was a mix on a mix cd that you got from your friends but besides that you were listening to that entire album at front to back and you were loving it yeah we we would purposely write a song that would help us kick off the show so the first song on on a place in the sun is a song called four do you know why it's called four I do not, but you're about to tell me. I'm about to tell you. It was the fourth song written in a batch of songs that we wrote. So we would write a batch of songs, and then we'd go in and record them. When we recorded the demos for that those four songs, we didn't even have a title for what became four. And the reason why it's called four is it was the fourth one written. So when we were going to put out A Place in the Sun, RCA came to us and said, well, what are you going to call that song? And we said, <laughs> we're, we're going to call it four. And they were so upset. Yeah, because they, they were like, we really like the song. We think it, it can potentially do something, but you can't just call it four. And we're all, we're calling it four. four. And, uh, yeah. and then uh, and then to follow up that for um, the Atomic album, we wrote uh, something to someone as an opening track because we thought of our albums as actual shows. So we would write the album as if it were a show. Well, that's cool. I, yeah. I feel like that's how Rush wrote, wrote 2112, right? Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. like it's it's a straight up rock opera and there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. We, you know, we could use a little bit more rock opera. Hell, I'll take Guar. You know what I'm saying? That was a yeah. rock opera in some form or fashion as well. Yeah. Yo, man. Yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for your time. For everybody at home, um, how can they get lit with all the music out there that you got? What's the best way to check everything out that you guys are up to? Litband.com is our website, and there's some stuff on there. But you can go to Instagram. Um, I believe we're on TikTok, and AJ kind of handles a lot of that stuff. Uh, So um, I jump in every now and then. I know we're on Facebook. I, do, I only do Instagram myself, and I believe uh, Lit Band Official is the um, social media handles. All right, Kevin, but, what are some of the next shows that you're going to be doing? We're doing this festival in New Jersey on uh, July 28th. We're going to be out there. And then we're going to be at the Wolf's Den at uh, Uncastle Casino or whatever. Unksville at Mohegan <laughs> Sun Arena. There was, it is. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. He'll be in Unksville, Connecticut. Uh, it's Uncasville, Connecticut uh, at know. Mohegan Sun Arena. Uh, yeah. And he'll be performing there. I was the voice of Foxwoods for like two years for a while. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I used to you, you talk with a smile. When you do when you do that voiceover yeah. stuff, so you can hear it, yeah. So, yeah. dude, have fun being back in Connecticut. And you know what? Everybody's playing the casinos, and I know why you're playing it because they treat you well over there. It's a dude. hell of a lot better than playing the Civic Center, right? <laughs> it's dude. It, they yeah, we've been treated very well, and uh, there's no shame in that game. <laughs> no, dude. If somebody gives you caviar and the other the the other people give you uh, uh, literally fish eggs, you know, th- yeah. there's a difference, and you can smell it. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, everybody, this is Kevin. He's from the band Lit. You know them. You love them. You should go to litband.com and 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 check out all of the new music. They're still making music. That's right. They're still making great yep. music. 
and Kevin will say, this album, on par or better. Or better, right? You're saying? Yeah. On, yeah. On par the the sun, yeah. or it's better. We're, we're, uh, we're pushing the song, uh, Life That I Got. Give that song a listen. You'll... That's a good one. Hey, you've been watching Logan Radio Rocks, AKA Logan Summit, Kevin from Lit. Go to litband.com right now. Litband.com, litband.com, litband.com. Don't be your, your own worst enemy. Do yourself a favor and listen to some great new music from the band Lit. You know them, yeah. you love them. Check it out, right, Kev? Yeah, man, go check it out, damn it. <laughs>